Father, I thank you for everything that you've shown us, that you've revealed to us in this prayer series. Father, I ask that signs and wonders will follow the preaching of Jesus. I pray that um, that you that live in us will continue to bring an inner witness to us uh, on your truths, that we can then just learn how to embrace them. And Father, let us have an ear to hear so that we can continually hear what your spirit is is showing us and saying to us and father i pray throughout this whole series that that the testimonies that will come out uh that people will have a deeper revelation of who you are and your love for them amen so we're continuing today in our prayer series and uh today i'm going to be talking about how to stop praying as a servant and start praying as a son. So as you know, we've been in this prayer series. It's um, a lot bigger than what we first anticipated when we first started. So we've only got one, I think, one message left after today. So um, I bet you're all excited about that one. But we've still got that prayer survey up. If you've got any questions, I'll post that in our WhatsApp group. If you've got any questions on prayer now's the time to do it because next week i'm looking at doing a message on frequently asked questions on prayer just to answer some of the things that um, may not have been answered within the prayer series or just to confirm what i've already said within the prayer series so i believe just to package a message like that might be helpful for some people just to just to connect the dots so that's what i'm hoping to do next week so if you do have any questions uh please just feel free to to write those out in that prayer survey that's all anonymous i don't know who's writing what so you can go for it you know <laughs> if, if you've got a problem with it otherwise email text me whatever so that's all good so let's uh get into today so today is and that's me go so how to stop praying as a servant and start praying as a son yes you get it guessed it we're up to now lesson 29 so if this is the first message that you've landed on this is some of the things that we have shared within this series the 28 previous lessons we've covered quite a bit we've gone through uh everything that we've been taught through on prayer probably 99 percent of the stuff i was taught on prayer and we have been right rightly dividing all of it through the lens of the new covenant and the finished work of Jesus and so with some of the scriptures that we've been taught about certain things about prayer as we've gone and looked at them we've seen that some actually uh, the um, author whether it was Jesus or Paul we found that some things actually aren't about prayer at all but we're communicating another amazing spiritual truth so this has been an amazing journey um, has for me as well I've packaged everything that I've learned over the 25 years into lessons um, but I hope that you have been learning and growing as we've been going along in this series so today how to stop praying as a servant and start praying as a son I'm hoping that it will just tie in what we've shared today and then conclude next week on how to pray I like the frequently asked questions I did have in there in as you may have noticed in some other um, lessons on uh, how to pray under the new covenant but I think as I've gone through each lesson and, and shared what prayer is or pr what prayer isn't hopefully it's become very clear a and just to make it so simple always remember the definition of prayer in Greek is pro acumai remember that the word definition from prayer in greek when you see prayed prayed praise praying it's pro acumai which means communion or fellowship and also we've learned that prayer is not about we pray and then god hear and then god hears and then responds to us but prayer is more about relationship and really when we understand the finished work and what god's already done for us it's all about us coming to god learning how to hear him so he can then guide and lead us in every area of life you know in the daily affairs of life so that's essentially the simplicity of what prayer is now how that looks like for you uh, i did share a message message on how to hear the holy spirit how to hear his voice how to be led by him um i would encourage you to re-watch that just um for a bit more so probably uh helpful information there but ultimately really what this looks like for you is personal it's between you and the father and and it's just learning to trust 
uh, how to hear and, and how to be led by him. I will cover that a little bit as we do a frequently asked questions because there have been a few questions on that one. So we ready? Let's just get into today's message. And uh, so that's what we've done so far. But ultimately, one thing I, I think we can all understand from a New Covenant perspective, that we are not slaves and we are not servants. You know, one thing I love that Jesus said to his disciples, you know, and remember what's spoken about in the Gospels, it's pre-cross. Jesus was born from a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. And we'll go through some scriptures on that in a second. But you know, so the so context is the key, but it, there's still a, a beautiful spiritual truth here. And this is what he said to his disciples. And this is John 15, 15 in the Amplified Classic Edition. And he says, I do not call you servants or slaves any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing or working out. But I have called you my friends because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. I have revealed to you everything that I've learned from him. You know, and ultimately when we're talking about slaves or servants, it's talking about being bound to the old covenant law and old covenant system. So really today as I'm covering about um, being a servant or a slave, it's just that mindset that, that even though we're new covenant Christians, it's so much uh, ingrained in our psyche, if you like. There's so much that we've been taught that's been a mixture of the two covenants over the years. I mean, I'm speaking to myself here, really. And it and for me, it's really taking, it feels like almost a lifetime to unlearn all that stuff. But we're not bound to a law, you know. We we are sons of God. Um, here, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants or slaves, but you're my friends. Why? Because, you know, a slave or a servant doesn't know what the master's doing. Doesn't, you know, but you are friends. I've revealed everything to you. And look at us under the new covenant. We have his very spirit, don't we? So always remember, this is great. I love this scripture, but this is spoken to those who are under the law. We are now post-cross. And look at what the word says to us, that we are his children. Galatians 4, 1 to 7 says, I love, uh, I love all of Galatians. It's Paul's really... Um, direct in how he says things. I love Galatians. If you read Galatians three to five, they're just it's just three powerful chapters that Paul really makes it quite clear that we're no longer bound to the law. It's all by um, faith in Jesus' finished work. But here he says, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. And so he's talking about, in Galatians 3, he was saying, talking about the law, was a tutor or a schoolmaster to keep us, you know, to lead us to Jesus until the way of faith came, which we now have. And then verse 3 says, So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now that's not talking about demonic powers, that's talking about the Mosaic law. Okay, <laughs> that's the context there. Um, verse 4, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Verse 6, Because you are sons. Okay, because we have, those who believe, have been adopted. We're now God's children. So because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. And we know that we are joint heirs with Jesus. Now, throughout this uh, message, as I talk about sons and not praying as a servant, but praying as a son, I, you know, I'm, I am talking about sons or daughters. I'm talking about children, but just for the title of this message, when I talk about being a son, uh, ultimately I'm talking, it's a figurative language for sons and daughters and children. I think that's pretty clear, but I just wanted to say that in case anybody gets offended by that term. But here can you see we're no longer, you are no longer a slave. So you're no longer into the Galatians. So you're not bound to the Mosaic law, okay? But you are now God's child. Since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. We know that we also joint heirs with Jesus. Very similar thing he said to the Romans in uh, 8, 15, 17. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage, 
uh, again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, this, the, both these passages are so powerful that we are children of God. We're not on a journey trying to become a child. When we put our faith in Je Jesus, we are children of God. We've been adopted. Where it talks about here in Romans, a spirit of adoption. Um, don't have time to go about into what that means, but ultimately that's talking about that the adopted child under Roman law. And I think even under Greek law, you had the full rights as a, a natural born child. So if someone, a family adopted a child into their family, it was no, the child was no different to a natural heir um, with the rights and the privileges and, and the inheritance, etc. And so Paul's communicating using that language to get us to understand as Gentiles that have come into uh, this, the family of God, that, that we have all the rights um, as an adopted child, we are now children of God. We are heirs and heirs according to the promise. And uh, it's just amazing. So I think we really need to understand that we are God's children and we really need to start approaching him as a child within his family and not from a mosaic law, slavery or servant perspective. And uh, it, it is a lot of unlearning that we do need to go to to get to that place. I'm still unlearning. I've still got my defaults. And so let me ask you this question, you know, when, when you relate to God, how you feel about God, do you feel that you approach him as a son, as part of that family, or do you feel that you're a servant? You're kind of um, a slave or a servant, you like just the way you approach him, how you feel to him in your relationship. You know, is God up and close and personal? Do you feel that you can connect with him? Or do you feel that he's distant and might be silent? And even sometimes maybe even dis disapproving. You know, this is really re real and uh, real questions. And ultimately, this is in your heart. You know, this I'm not putting answers here. But really, I'd like you to just to think and meditate on this. How do I relate to God? When I approach God, when I pray, when I connect with him, how do I approach him? How do I feel about my relationship with him? Is, is he with me or, or do I feel that he's over there distant somehow? And I'd encourage you to rewatch my our message on unanswered prayer just to the what we covered is that God loves you unconditionally regardless of your circumstances. So we really do need to get past judging our relationship with God with by what we experience. And that that's a big mindset shift as well in and of itself. So... And, you know, you may understand the finished work of the cross. You may understand God is love. You may understand God's goodness, but you still may struggle in your prayer life and your intimacy with God. You still may find it difficult to connect with him. And sometimes it's just a matter of we really got to renew our mind and unlearn a whole bunch of stuff. You know, and I've said here in my uh, PowerPoint here that prayer, which is communion and fellowship with God, it's meant to be one of the simplest, most natural functions of a believer's life. But, you know, as we've seen throughout this whole prayer series, it's become one of, look at what I've said here, most one of the most convoluted, complicated and misunderstood things in all of Christendom. It really has. And so as you've seen throughout, we're now up to tw tw lesson 29, that that's so much stuff that, that we've had to expose and to bring in light with the new covenant. Uh, and there's so much that we really do need to continue to unlearn all that man-made stuff and just get back to basics of what prayer is meant to be. And our relationship with God is meant to be. Um, you know, I'm not one, if you, you get to know me, I've changed a lot in this area, I was quite the opposite, but I'm not one to see that, that you know, there's a demon under every rock or, you know, people need deliverance of multiple demons or anything like that and i don't always believe that everything's a satanic attack i think that we can pretty much can stuff up our own lives ourselves and you know we suffer because we live in a fallen world with fallen men so there's a lot of stuff that happens there however when it comes to prayer i really do believe the adversary has been working over time to separate us from the father's love and, and I tell you, you know, if a believer can lay hold of Jesus and the finished work of the cross, they can lay hold of God's unconditional love for them, then you know what? It is game over for the adversary. 
He can't separate you through lies and deception anymore. So can you see why he has fought so hard to separate us and to make prayer so difficult and so convoluted and, and, and all this stuff has got in the way of, of us just simply connecting with the Father, knowing he's our loving Heavenly Father, knowing what God has already done for us through his Son so we can simply have relationship with him. Instead, we're placed on the wrong side of the cross and we're continually striving to earn or striving to, to lay hold of something that God's already provided for us. So, you know, and that's really true spiritual warfare, isn't it? Is that we need to take every belief system we have in this area, um, you know, that puts us on the wrong side of the cross or under the wrong covenant or even our wrong perspective of God. And that's so we need to cast all that stuff down and bring it captive to the new covenant and to Jesus and who Jesus is and what we have through him. And so that is the real spiritual warfare to remind ourselves of Jesus and his finished work. And, you know, and I really, it's my heart throughout this whole series that we ultimately, you know, that we get past the, you know, the wrong teaching, the man-made stuff, the tradition stuff and, and stop approaching God as a servant and really start relating to him as a son or a daughter, a child. Okay. And then, you know, experience all the benefits and everything that we have within God's family. Really, it's just, uh, that is my heart and that is my prayer for you. So what does praying as a servant look like? And there's two sides of the coin here is, you know, number one, very simply, it's really trying to get God to, to, to move. So you're asking God to do what he's already done because it puts you on the wrong side of the cross, puts you under kind of under the wrong covenant type of thinking. Uh, it's also following methods and formulas, you know, rather than being open, honest and vulnerable, rather than going, you know, oh God, Jesus, help me. You know, I don't know what to pray here. I don't know what to do. I'm desperate, you know, or I'm in pain or whatever. And Jesus, help me. And that can be the most powerful prayer rather than stuff that methods and formulas and, you know, etc. Another thing is praying by rote, by memorizing a prayer. And I've said here, rather than communicating from your heart in your own words, uh, with our kids, one thing that, that we've done since they were, you know, even as they were babies, we used to pray for them every night. And, and as they'd get older and as they were able to speak, we would then um, share with them, okay, now, you know, we'd go in and go, okay, now you can pray for yourself. Now you can talk, now you can communicate and understand. You can pray to, to, um, to, to the Father yourself. And I remember we used to do that with the kids. And I remember one night in particular, and it had been happening for a while, my, our son Aiden, he would just go, thank you, Father, bless you, Father. Thank you, bless mum and dad. Thank you, blah, 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 amen. Okay, done. And then he went, rolled over and said, night, mum. And, and that would happen for a while. And then it just, it just after a while, because I used to think, great, he's prayed. You know, box ticked. <laughs> and, and then I thought about it. I thought, this kid... He's praying, but there's zero connection, zero understanding of what he's doing. And, and here I am feeling like, oh, he's ticked his, bo ticked his box, box, he's prayed. Uh, he's right now and I'm happy because my son's prayed. But but there was no connection. So I actually stopped and, and with all of them. And I said, right, I want you to pray. I don't want to make prayer like a chore to you, something you feel you have to do or to, to appease me or even to appease God because that's not what it's about. It's about relationship. And I said, even if you go, thank you, God, amen. Thank you, God, for tonight, not even amen, but thank you, God, for everything. Or I love you, God. Or, you know, just pray for me a heart. And I said, you know, I'm not going to stand here and make you do it, but I encourage you just to do that between, you know, when I leave the room. It's between you. It can even be a thought. And so I began to change how we began to teach our kids. And because if really it was, there was something they're doing from rote, no heart in it. So really, what was the point? What was the point? You know, and uh, you may think that's heresy, um, but there was no connection. You can pray till you're blue in the face. You can recite prayer for an hour. You can get out the prayer book and read every prayer in it. But if you're just doing it as a method of formula or by rote or just without even understanding what you're doing or even without any connection, what is the point? That is just, uh, I know I'm coming across pretty black and white, but it just really began to, to, even how I viewed prayer and how I connected with God, it was huge even coming to that point. Um, going back to these notes. So what does praying as a servant look like? You know, praying out of fear. 
just feeling, you know, oh, am I doing everything right here? Um, or even just concern, you know, God, are you displeased with me? Have I done everything right today? That That's coming from a place of being a servant. Even if you're making sure that you've done everything correctly, like, hang on, have I prayed in faith? Actually, have I entered the gates with thanksgiving? Have I entered the courts with praise? Have I thanked God? Have I worshipped him? You know, the little checkbox of I need to, to pray, I need to repent, I need to do all this stuff. I actually, like, I'm really talking about my own history here. This is what I've struggled with. This, I'm being really raw and real with you. I've come from this for myself. So I know what both sides of the coin look like or from um, being in both these places. So I'll continue. So, you know, have I been in faith? Have I, thank God. Okay, God, thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for everything you're going to do for me. And the next, you, you know, and I used to also have prayer lists. So I kid you not. Ah, let me put this back. There we go. So I used to have prayer lists and what I used to do on my prayer lists, I would have two points because I'd read out my prayer lists and pray over my prayer lists continually and they kept getting bigger and being a big, bigger and I'd cross off the things that had been answered. But at the end of every prayer list, I kid you not, I'd have two paragraphs and God, anything, I pray for anything that I haven't even thought of yet, anything that I don't even know that's going to, you know, what's going to happen or whatever, you know, like a little clause along those lines. And the other one was, um, and anything I've forgotten, I want to cover all that too. So if there's anything I've forgotten or anything I haven't thought of, anything um, I cover and pray for that area too, you know. And I kid you not, I did that for a long time. And so I'm kind of like, great, I've covered every base, I've dotted every I, I've crossed every T, prayer list sorted. Um, that's my history of how I used to pray. Um, you may also feel distant you, that you don't even connect with God and, and or even feel that he's, he, he's not listening or he doesn't hear you. Uh, again, I would watch my our lesson on unanswered prayer because um, it, it, we really do need to get past of judging our relationship with God based upon circumstances. It really is a huge mindset shift, that one. But you can, if you feel there's no change in your circumstances, you can start to feel distant. You can start to feel that God's not hearing or, or answering. But when you understand the finished work of the cross and understand God's unconditional love for you, you can then start to rightly divide those feelings and really come to a place where you can start to experience and know his love for you regardless of what you're facing. You know, again, I've covered this, but, you know, not wanting to miss something out or get anything wrong. You know, have I missed something? And should I have covered the prayer from this angle? Should I have prayed for this? Have I missed anything? Praying for others even. You know, just that sort of mindset. Uh, not feeling worthy or accepted by God unless you've done something first. Um, I remember uh, a time where um, uh, we had our car broke down and we couldn't get to church. Um, we would still gave and tithed and everything. So we had no money to fix the car. And so we just could not physically get to church. I felt so guilty and, and, and so <laughs> bad that we couldn't get to church. I was actually quite tormented. I felt like I was open to some spiritual attack. Um, it's kind of the teaching as well that we, we had at that time. And it sounds silly, but when you hear stuff like that constantly, it, it does become part of your belief system. And, and so it's like I've missed church. So, you know, so I spent the whole day praying, trying to make up for it. Um, I kid you not. Um, I thank God that the new covenant and Jesus has made me free. <laughs> now, the thing is praying out of obligation or duty. Uh, that was a massive one for me. Uh, I felt that's what God is ex it's expected of me. And then when I started to learn the goodness of God, that I learned that it wasn't from God's part, it's still, as a believer, I still need to do this. Even though God's not expecting it, I still need to do this. If I want to grow, if I want to you know, have a thriving ministry, etc., I still have to do it. But still coming from a place of praying as a servant and of a servant, to, you know, being a servant and not a son, not sonship. So all of that, rather than all of this, it's like doing rather than resting in God's unconditional love. And I've said here, the heart of a servant, you can't rest because the motivation is coming from an obligation. When you're obligated, you feel there's a duty or an obligation. It, 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 it demands from you. You know, you don't feel you can rest because there's always that expectation. Uh, and also, if we're fearful of missing something out, or in, even in our daily walk with God, and we're displeasing God, then our faith, our faith is not in our relationship with God. It, it's because it, there's still that expectation um, placed upon us, even in our behaviour and how we relate to Him. 
Um, so then the flip side of this, the other thing that can happen, and I've been on this coin side of the coin too, you know, is that you feel accepted by God because of what you do, because you pray every morning and you pray every evening, because you have your quiet time, you spend time in the word, you pray for others rather than yourself, you know, you've pray, entered the gates with thanksgiving, prayed in tongues, you've done this, you've done that, spent a good hour in prayer, so you think, right, that's it, I'm qualified for ministry, or I'm accepted because I've done my duty, or I've gone to church. But even sometimes as a pastor or a leader and you serve in any capacity in a church, you can feel that you're kind of accepted because you're a ser you're serving. Hang on, I'm serving God, so God's pleased with me. Um, and it is the flip side of self-righteousness because you still qualify yourself by what you do. You know, the other side, you, you feel disqualified because what you don't do, but this side, you feel qualified because what you do do. And, you know... It's really a big mindset shift. Yes, there's stuff we do as believers, but it's never to earn love or acceptance or salvation from God. Never. It's still coming from a servant mentality. There's still that obligation. Where's your heart motivation, you know? And ultimately, many believers do believe that this is what God expects from us uh, or it is expected as a believer if we're going to have a thriving ministry, if we're going to succeed as a Christian or in any area of life. But we always need to remember that you cannot earn anything from God. We can't earn salvation, favor, blessing, anything. Okay, it all comes from what we believe, not by what we do. God loves us, accepts us. He saved us because we put our faith in, our, in his son, not by who we are, not by what we do, but ultimately by what we believe. And that's what resting in Jesus' finished work is. So whatever we do for God, and I've bolded this, so it should flow through our hearts, through our relationship. Whatever we do for God should never be out of a place of a, a duty or an obligation. Where we feel that it's demanded from us or it's required of us, whether it's God directly or whether that's something we need to do. Because I need to live this Christian life. I need to have a thriving ministry. I've got to pray. I've got to do this X, Y, or Z. It's still coming from a place of works, if you like. It's still a servant mentality, a work mentality. Um, we learnt this. This slide is um, I've adapted this from the message that we did is on God and um, um, prayer and God's sovereignty in the second message, and we learnt there that God is complete and whole, and, and the the reality is that God does not need, demand, or require for us to serve Him, to pray, to praise Him, or to worship Him, or even to thank Him, offer thanksgiving. God doesn't require that or demand that from us you know god exists in a relationship he is whole he is complete he is lacking no nothing the father son and spirit they coexist as a complete family as three in one okay they're all in perfect unity god doesn't lack anything that he needs us he our praise our worship he's you know you you look at all the um you know, the pagan societies and the everything around the time of Abraham and Israel. It's what everybody was doing. You look at Egypt, the amount of gods they had. Everything they did, all their sacrifices were to appease all the gods. You know, you, they had a sacrifice so that they would get rain. You know, the rain god or the sun god or the this god or that god. And really, there's, there's, that, um, tr there's a trace of that still in Christendom today. That it's almost like that we do stuff to kind of appease God. We may not put it in that that wording, but it, it's kind of when you break it down, as it's a core belief system of ultimately what we believe that God somehow needs to be appeased, and it's not the truth. God doesn't need anything from man. God is complete and whole. The whole reason why He created man in the in the first place is to be an inter, an integral part of His creation, and ultimately for relationship. He wanted us for relationship. And so, you know, I was saying God doesn't demand or need anything from us because he's whole and he's complete. Okay. And uh, like, and that's what I've said at the bottom here. We've got to be careful when looking at scripture because some scripture, you know, like a, my favorite scripture, Exodus 23, 25 to 26, worship the Lord your God. A lot of translations say serve the Lord your God. That is old covenant. That's under the mosaic system. 
and we're going to look at what Jesus um, shares a little bit here. But as a child, you know, worship is great. Don't get me wrong. We worship God for who he is, but God doesn't demand that. It's not a requirement. God doesn't require it from us unless it comes from a heart of gratitude unless it comes from a flow overflowing from our relationship it's coming from obligation and duty it's not coming out of love so can you see like do you think god will be accepted from that if you feel you're giving him praise and worship because you feel that's what he demands of you as any parent, if you feel that your children came up and go, oh, God, you're, you know, Dad, you're amazing, you're wonderful, I think you're fantastic, and you're like, what? You know, as a parent, you're thinking, well, what do you want? Not that I want to relate God to an earthly parent, but I can tell when my kids want something because of the way they approach me. They approach me completely differently. You know, I remember when they were younger, you know, they come up to me, well, I've done all my cho- the stuff on the, you know, the chores because they all have responsibilities. You know, I've cleaned my room. You know, stuff that we're all meant to do anyway. You know, I've done all this and done all that. It's like, yeah, what do you want? You know, (laughs) you can see right through them. God's no different. He knows, you know, Jesus said he knows what you need before you ask. And he said, ultimately, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you, you know. And we don't need to pray for the things that God's already freely provided. Uh, We'll go through that in a second. But it's, you know, there's so much ingrained in us. Yes, God is the creator of the universe. He is worthy of our praise, absolutely. But I hope you understand where I'm coming from. If you're doing it as a requirement, as a duty, under obligation, then there's no heart connection. It's not a response of faith uh, or love. It's coming from being a slave or a servant. It's out of obligation and duty. Ultimately, you cannot rest in God's goodness. You can't rest in his relationship with him unless you know he's at rest with you. God is at rest. He's not meaning. He's not angry with you. He's not displeased with you. He's not judging. He's not examining. He's not scrutinizing your performance or behavior. You know, he's at rest with you, with what Jesus has done. We're loved. We're accepted. We're approved. We are his children. Ultimately, what pleases him, we know, is faith in his son. Without faith, we're told it's impossible to please God. You know, without faith, without trusting and believing in Jesus. You know, most believers, I've heard this, heard this quite a bit, that they, they'd just be so happy to hear when they, you know, die and enter eternity and God says, well, well done, good and faithful servant. You know what? <clears throat> That's coming from a place of a servant, not a son. I don't want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. Under the law, that's probably good. Under a slave master thing, that's good. But that's not coming from sonship. You with me? Remember, we are heirs, joint heirs. We are seated with him in heavenly places. It's so ingrained, isn't it? Um, religion is ingrained in us. It's it's so hard. So, you know, we've either way on that, what I shared, what praying as a servant or approaching God as a servant looks like both sides of the coin there we've got to stop coming to God on our own self-righteousness whether good or bad whether we feel that we've ticked all the boxes or we we can't even tick the boxes we're not good enough or whatever you know we've just got to approach God based on our faith in Jesus knowing that because we believe in him we are already loved accepted approved and we've entered into God's family so we can start relating to God as a child of God and not under a slave or a servant mentality. Amen. It's so important that we do this. And we know that rest, it's not in inactivity, it's spirit led activity. I talk about that all the time. So it's not sitting and doing nothing, but it's a belief system as well because what you believe will drive you. Um, you know, so if you feel that I've got to pray, uh, for if I want to have a thriving ministry, if I want to succeed in life, if I want to get an increase in finances, if I want to get a new job or a new house or whatever, I have to pray. So if you don't believe that it's expected from God this way, but you need to, it's still coming from the wrong side of the cross. It's still coming from a slave or a servant mentality because um, it's driving you. You've got to do something rather than hang on. Jesus has uh, provided this for me. Uh, how can I connect with him that through relationship he can guide and lead me in my day-to-day life, you know? And so that's your methods and your formulas too. 
So when you know that God's at rest, this Jesus is at rest, you are seated with them in heavenly places, it does stop that uh, laboring and striving that you have for life, it, you know, really. And ultimately, I've said here in my notes, it's ultimately with salvation, it's self-denial uh, is ceasing from your own laboring and striving, trying to produce something for yourself, even through your own prayers. That if I pray and I do this and I've got to do that, I've got to do X, Y, and Z to get, you know, X, you know, do A, B, C to get, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got to do something to get something. It's still an old covenant mindset rather than relationship where the father provides for their children and through your relationship you can enjoy everything within that household and what's been provided for you. Um, it's a completely different mindset. So, you know, and through this whole prayer series, what I've shared with you that when you do understand what who Jesus is and what he's already freely done, your whole prayer life is transformed. And that, you know, I began to ask questions. Well, if Jesus has done everything and provided everything for me, then why do we need to do pray in this and do this prayer or do that prayer? What's that about? How does that fit in? And so that was where I really began to, to look at our prayer, how I related with God, how I approached God, how I live my Christian life, you know. And because at some point you've got to translate the finished work into your daily journey. Otherwise, you've just laid hold of something, but nothing else has changed. But you do over a period of time. You find a question. You begin to question things and look at things, and they're go it's good to question. It's good to look through and and ask yourself, why do I do the things I do? Because whatever you do, you want to do out of revelation. You want to do it through relationship. Uh, question mark. You know that was a big question mark for me. Do I? Do I want to just do what I've been told? Um, and it's not out of a rebellion or anything like that. But why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I pray the way I pray? That's uh, because I've been taught that way. But let's look at that. And so that's really the 25 years ago, which began this series. But just you know, when you know that prayer is simply communion and fellowship with God, you learning to hear Him, to know Him. Really, it does just expose all the man-made stuff and what we've been taught, and it, you know, and then you need a lifetime to unlearn all that. <laughs> Uh, always remember what Jesus has done is finished. You know, it's the way sometimes that we pray. We really do need to remind ourselves that God is not the, a sugar daddy. So it's not if we do good, we behave good, and we do favors for God, then he's going to provide for us, okay? Um, sometimes the way I approach God and the way I pray, that is pretty much how I felt. But as I mentioned, my kids would do that when they'd approach me, and you can see right through them. And I remember so clearly one time God said to me, uh, you know, Sean and I were laughing and going, oh, well, that was obvious what they wanted, you know, because they'd come and I've cleaned my room and I've done this and I've done that and I'm such a good child. And it's like, we're like, yeah, what do you want? Oh, can I go and play at so-and-so's place or can they come over here? And it's like, there we go. That's where we were aiming for. And Sean and I were laughing at that, that we could see straight through it. And I heard so clearly God said to me, you know, you're the same with me, you know, and, and it's like, oh. <gasps> You know, that was very confronting. It's like, yes, the way I pray and I approach you is not dissimilar, really, the way that I did that. And it was like, and I told Sean and we just laughed at it. But at some point I thought, gee, I really want to look at this because do I feel that I'm, you, you know, I can approach God and I do right, be right, and oh, God, you're amazing, and you, you know, praise and worship. I'd always do that at the beginning, and it was kind of like a method and formula, but I felt that I needed to do that. But God already knew what I needed before I even opened my mouth. But when I understood Jesus, I already had the provision, I already had the answer. So you get to get past all this stuff that we've been taught or self taught or whatever, and just being able to come and go, Jesus, help me. You know, or even just when you get past because you understand the finished work, you just go, right, I'm going to spend time with you for who you are, not for what I can get from you. You know, I say all the time, why go after healing when you can get to know the healer? You know, why go after provision or anything else when you've got the provider? You can learn just to spend time with him and get to know him. It's so simple, isn't it? Another thing I've said here with there's this real reaping and sowing mindset and we covered this kind of as blessing and curses 
in last lesson, but it really is we reap, we've been taught so much that you reap what you sow. Yeah, that there's a world system that works that way. Uh, ultimately, the food ecosystem <laughs> works that way. You sow a seed, you get whatever. Uh, and within the, the law and the principles of this world, yes, but in God's kingdom under the new covenant, it's about faith in Jesus. It's unconditional. The law, reaping and sowing, blesses and curses, was based on performance, on fulfilling the law. You know, the new covenant, Jesus has done that for us. It's based on faith, putting our faith in Jesus and his performance and what he's fulfilled for us. So we've got to get past this do good, get good, do bad, get bad mentality. It's still a servant mosaic law focused mindset okay as we know what we've covered throughout this all this prayer series on the finished work always remember the new covenant is that it's not about us having to do anything because god has already done everything for us through his son that's why it's a better covenant based on better promises we put our faith in jesus we rest in jesus performance alone and rest in god's love for us and then out of that as we're led we can then respond in life anything else that we do out of an obligation or duty is really out of a uh, works mindset and because we've been taught that we don't know any better really so really when you get to this point and you learn about that finished work you do go from one prayer request to another prayer request or even i've said here from seasons in god you learn just to live and flow in your relationship with him and i tell you on the other side um because i've been on both sides here just living with jesus if i can put it that way living with jesus it's just such a joy and a blessing there's such a freedom with it it really is so you know and looking at that and, and going back to this whole what i'm sharing today on getting past praying and approaching god as a servant and start as a child or a son let's look at how children actually relate to their parents you know so are children expected to perform for their parents by watching their behavior um completing a list of chores uh bringing gifts of praise and thanksgiving and honoring their parents or whatever to do that before they are provided and cared for absolutely not they don't you know being part of your household our kids and part of our household they are already provided and cared for uh, it's what we do as uh, parents right and so i've asked another question is a father's goodness and provision towards his children based upon the kids actions and their behavior or ability or upon his own character and, and a, a, upon his own ability you know as parents we work you know sean and i have worked to provide for our children you know and ultimately parents want to give their their children the best in life you want to give your child a better life than what you've had yourself in most cases you know it, it's it's your kids don't have to perform or to serve you or to worship you before you do that you do that because they are your children so can you see with what I'm touching on here that how religion and all the man-made stuff has really turned a, a relationship with God into this sick codependency? How we relate to him, how we approach him is just so far removed to how Jesus came to reveal the Father. He is your loving, heavenly Father. He loves you, you know, but we're still under this old covenant servant slave mentality of expectation obligation and duty always remember covenant is a provision it's where god provides something for us we know he will not break or alter his covenant and we know that's eternal life and that's a kingdom and everything within the kingdom so you know it, it's just really we really need to get past the the working towards what we've already got and just learning to rest in what we already have through jesus uh, Romans 8, I've already shared this at the beginning of this message. It says, you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And just briefly, the word Abba there is Aramaic for Father. So Father, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we're 
heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We know Paul also said in Ephesians, we're seated with him already in heavenly places. We're not trying to get there, my friends. We are already there. Okay, as soon as you uh, respond to Jesus, you are seated with him. You become a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You know, we've got to renew our mind to this truth. We've got to start approaching God as a heavenly father. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't have to butter God up to get anything from him. You know, he's not that sugar daddy in the Bible, the genie in the Bible. And understanding that finished work will really uh, bring us to the end of that mindset. And I've said here, he, you know, yes, within a household, within a family, there are certain responsibilities that every family member needs to perform for the household to function. Alt you know, absolutely, I don't dispute that whatsoever. But it's never to earn favor or love or acceptance or provision to be loved for and cared for. Never. Okay, so while my children have certain th duties and things they need to do, we all do stuff around the house. You know, our kids make clean their own rooms. They do their now they're eighteen. They do their all oh, in their twenties now. They do their own washing. Um, we have like a little roster system. Someone washes up. Someone takes the bins out. We all do stuff still as we can function as a family. Yes, even in the twenties, they still need a list because they just don't do it. But that's another story for another day. But can you see? So there's still stuff you do, but it's not to earn my love or my favor or my provision they have my provision because they're in my household they can take anything they want within my household because it's provided for them they have their bed they have their room they have they have a fridge they can go to you know it's because i love them it's not based on them worshiping me thanking me um their performance we if they do do their chores they don't put out the bins don't do the dishes doesn't mean they they're out on the street doesn't mean i don't love them anymore my DNA is in my children regardless of what they do. I love them regardless of what they do. If they, if they left this house and they decided they didn't want to have it part of my life or uh, be in contact anymore, you know what? It would not change the fact that I still love my kids, will not change the fact that my DNA is in them, that they have a provision here in my home and they're just not experiencing it. Okay, but it's here, there for them regardless. And that is the father towards us. And I think the belief systems we have is really what separates us from knowing that we belong to an amazing family. We have this amazing provision and we can experience God's goodness. You know, even in a church system, I'll address this as a church within a church or a ministry. Absolutely. there, I believe that really the members really need to take responsibility and have there's certain things they need to perform for the church to function or the ministry to function. Uh, the bigger it gets, the more um, hands on deck that you need, the more finances you need, etc. But again, that's never this way between you and God. Okay, while there may be a, a the leadership of that church or that ministry may have a requirements, you must serve. You must if you use it, you you're on the roster. Um, so if you have kids that go in the children's ministry, you're on the roster. If you do this, you use it. You're on the roster. You know, there's certain things you do that, that to get that to function properly, but don't ever relate it this way to God. Okay, it doesn't, it isn't to earn favor with God or blessings or salvation, healing, anything else. It's just within that whole household how that functions. We've got to separate the two. And unfortunately, because some leadership wants to get people to serve and do stuff, they, yeah, you know, let's leave that alone. But can you see we've got to not translate this way how we relate and how we function within a household or a church or a ministry? Never relate it this way. We never do anything to earn favor, to be loved and accepted and approved or get answers to prayer or whatever from God. It's a gift of God, not a boast of um, work so that we can't boast. You know, let's go to prove this point. Let's look at the beginning, you know, at creation with Adam. I, I go through this all the time because I am brought back to this when I start looking at a relationship with God. You see that at, at upon creation, Adam fellowship with God in the cool of the day. We saw that uh, as you read through the account of Genesis. But there was an, he didn't have a petition prayer. He didn't have a supplication for He didn't have a prayer of faith. He didn't have anything like that. He just made use of what God had already freely provided for him. So he didn't have to ask for any the basics for food or, you know, <laughs> anything. 
they, the basics were taken care of. He just, as I said, he made use of what God had already freely provided for him. He related with God. He had a relationship with God. It was just, it was natural. Now, we know that changed after the fall. And really, it, it's, we've been struggling to get back to that place ever since. And, and it's really religion that has got us there and why it makes it so difficult. But let's look at some of the instructions that God gave at Adam Upon creation, you know, what did he say in Genesis 1, 26 to 28? Upon, you know, the Adam's, he created Adam. This is, we know in Genesis 1, he says, be fruitful. He blessed them. God blessed them. He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Okay. And then he said to him in chapter two, as creation is then, it's uh, gone through in a bit more detail. He says, right, Adam, I'll give you every tree to eat except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. So you can have everything that I've freely provided for you. And we know that he did partake of that and there was a fall. So what were the instructions to Adam after the fall? What he, as you look at Genesis 3, 17 to 19, God then says to Adam, the, it says, the ground is cursed for thy sake. And when you look at that in, in uh, the, the Hebrew there, it says, the ground is now cursed because of you. And other translations say that. In other words, because of what you've done, the ground is now cursed. So you now need to labor and toil um, to provide for yourself rather than having, you know, everything you could just lay and take hold of. But now you've got to actually till the ground and work the ground and reap and sow if you like with all of that. Okay, so can you see what, you know, this Adam represents all of mankind. And, you, and Paul talks about in Romans 5, you know, there's two men that represent all mankind. You're either dead in Adam or you're alive in Christ. So Adam and Eve representing all mankind, what else did God say to them in regards to relationship, in regards to prayer, after the fall even, what did he say? Let's look at what God didn't say, okay? <laughs> He didn't say, thou shalt ask me to provide for you. You need to pray for me every, pray to me every morning and evening. evening. You need to pray and praise and worship me. You got to offer, offer up prayers of thanksgiving. You need to meditate on how good I am. That's a big one in New Covenant circles today. Um, you know, yes, we do, but it's, but it's not to earn. It's to renew our mind, but still it's come, come, even something simple like that. I need to meditate on God's love. I need to meditate on God's goodness. If it's coming from, it's not coming from relationship and wanting to renew our mind. It's coming from a place of being a servant. You know, it's a mentality is, is what I'm trying to address here. So we need to start approaching God as a son, God didn't say to Adam, you've got to meditate on how good I am. You need to praise me and worship me. Make sure you're thankful, you know, is what we're taught today. Now, God, while God is worthy to be praised, he's the creator of the universe. Once again, he does not demand these things from us. Religion has placed that upon us. God is after relationship. God created man, Adam and Eve and mankind for relationship. Um, God's complete and whole and lacking nothing. And out of his love, he created mankind so he could pour his life into us, that we can enjoy his life. And remember, Jesus, as the last Adam, came and redeemed us from everything that first Adam brought upon us. Okay, so God, you, you, if, if it was that important, don't you think God would have said to Adam upon creation or even after the fall, this is how thou shalt relate to me. And the silence, let's not read into what's not there. Think of just the basic basics of a parent and a child. It's the responsibility of a parent, of a father, to provide for their family and their children, to invest their life in them. And I mentioned this before, you know, most parents, and obviously there's some bad parents that don't take that analogy too far, but a good father, a good parent, parent will want to provide for their kids and set their kids up for their life set up an inheritance for them so you know set them up with what they didn't have ultimately that's what a parent wants to do they work hard to provide for their kids you know I know my own family have done that and, and you know that that don't that's a natural earthly parent Jesus himself said how much more will the father take care of you and provide for you you know, when in Matthew 6, don't worry about your life, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. 
You know, you said, don't worry about that stuff. The pagans run about that stuff. The pagans worry about that. You know, but God will provide for you. The birds of the air, you know, how much more? He loves you more. Will he provide for you? And we know what he did through Jesus and his finished work. You know, it's a parent's children don't have to work for an inheritance. Okay, the parents provide the inheritance and that's what the father has done. You don't earn it. Okay, by what you do, by serving God, by all the stuff we're taught we're meant to do as believers. You know, <laughs> it's a gift. Your parents provide that. Uh, and, and you inherit that as part of the family. By your birth, you inherit that. And under our, the new birth in the kingdom, we've inherited everything that Jesus has provided for us. You know, a servant in a household doesn't receive an inheritance. Only a son does. And that's just a comment on what you to think about. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians 3, 26 to 29, Paul says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And we know that we have salvation. We have the kingdom of God. We have everything that we need. As a son, as an heir, we don't have to work for, earn or perform duties to receive. Why? Because the, God's kingdom already belongs to us. He provided that freely for us. You know, I've shared Matthew 6, uh, you know, where Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. The uh, cross reference or another place this is mentioned is in Luke chapter 12. And uh, how Luke ends it, like Matthew in verse 6, 6, 33 says, So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. How Luke ends it, he says, Don't be afraid and anxious, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, he, and that's what the father has done. It's his good pleasure to give, and that's what he's done, because this was spoken pre-cross, we have the kingdom. The kingdom already belongs to us. It's ministered through the Holy Spirit, and the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. The, that we have, through the Holy Spirit, salvation, which is eternal life, deliverance, forgiveness, etc., etc., etc. And we went through that a little, in a little bit more detail in my message on uh, prayer and Jesus' finished work. So you can watch that if you want to get a bit more of an understanding salvation we i think we understand this i think i'm preaching to the converted now but everything that jesus provided for us is a fact it's an established fact it's a done deal you know we know that it's outlined in the word but it's our inheritance we don't work for it we don't earn it we came into that when we said yes to jesus that provision is ours it's there it's ready and it's waiting for us okay so anything we feel we need to be or to do for God, it, it can't, does come from servant, being a servant. It's from a law and works mindset. It doesn't come from being a son, having a provision in the family. We can just lay hold of what the Father has provided for us. Just as my kids don't have to go, oh, can I please use the shower today? Can I please grab something out of the fridge? You know, it, it's their household. I provide it for them. You know, it's, we've got to start relating to God very similar. Okay, so I shared last week in Galatians 5, 1 to 6 that Paul says, and I encourage you to read that, Galatians 5, 1 to 6 in the Amplified uh, Bible, because he says, anything you do, if you feel you've got to follow the, the law uh, to be made right with Christ or to receive your salvation, he said, you've fallen from grace completely fallen from grace you don't work for anything that god has already freely provided so don't try and work for something that god's already given to you and provided for you again i think i've already shared this we're saved by grace through faith as a gift not of works so we can't boast it's got to be a gift absolutely a gift okay so Again, just to, to share some of my favorite scriptures from you in a second, that we've got to continue to remind ourselves that the Father did all the work. So we don't have to. The Father and the Son are resting. The provision is there. It's made for us. So we've got to be delivered from this works mindset. 
okay it's it, just in every area look at this mark 10 45 jesus says himself the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many and that's also mentioned in matthew 20 verses 28 and, and like that can be a real shock for most of us because that's not our mindset that god needs us to serve him we've got to do ministry we've got to do this we've got to do that no jesus says, i didn't come to be served I came to serve. I came to serve you. I came to lay my life down for you, to give you life, to give you the kingdom. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom so you can come into the family. Stop trying to strive to earn and by watching your performance, by what you do, but instead coming into the provision, coming back into that place of rest that what Adam had in the beginning and the relationship of rest that where God has provided everything for us. You know, when you look at scripture, he's did it all before us, before we were even born. We didn't have to do anything. The father did everything through the son already. So why we're taught that we've got to do stuff, it's just, it, it's, I don't know. It's crazy, isn't it, when you really look at it. So let's look at some of these scriptures. These are some of my favorite scriptures, and I often get these quickened to me. And uh, Romans 5, beautiful. It says, while, um, be prior to this, Paul says, while we were without strength, Christ died for us. And then you keep reading verse 8. He says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, he demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. We didn't have to pray and ask God to give us Jesus. He did it because he loved us. And that's the same with everything else. You know, because God has already given us his very best through his son, we already have everything we could possibly need. John 3.16, love this one. We all know this. For God so loved the world that he gave. He did it. He gave Jesus, his only begotten son. We know so whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5.18, which comes straight after anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Verse 18, now all things are of God or from God. In other words, God has done it all and says, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, Jesus Christ. The Amplified Classic Edition, which I know by right because I love it, it said that God was personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up men's sins against them, but cancelling them and then giving us that message of reconciliation so that by thought and deed, we might aim to bring others into restoration or favor with God which is peace with God. God did it all himself through his son. He came down as Jesus and righted all the wrongs for us. He reconciled us and restored us to favor with himself before we were born, before we even had a prayer request, before we even had a need. While we were still sinners, God did this because he so loved us, loved mankind. He wanted to restore what Adam had lost. He wanted to bring us back to that place of relationship, of not being fearful and running and hiding from God like Adam did. And but coming back into that place of relationship of father and son. Again, Romans 8 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. God did it all by sending his own son. And it continues in the likeness of sinful flesh. And on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. God did it. What the law could not do, God did himself for you. In other words, can you? I love all these scriptures. God did it for you. He righted all the wrongs for us. How am I going for time? Okay. He provided the way for us to have peace with him, a right standing with him that we can be seated with the son. We're joint heirs so we can start relating to him as Abba Father. He then gives us his very spirit upon salvation. That's an inner witness that bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. So we can cry out, Daddy, Father. You know, how far removed has religion have taken us from that simple truth ultimately god wanted to spend eternity with us that's why he did it to right all the wrongs to what was lost at that fall 
He completed all the work. He did it all. And that's why I love, I say this all the time, I love that Jesus actually used words on the cross that it is finished. And then when he sent it into heaven, he sat down because his work was done. It was finished. It was complete. The Father did everything for us. We can't add to a perfect or complete or finished work. We need to remind ourselves that we are seated with him, that we are a joint heir. We've got the inheritance. We have been accepted and loved and approved because we are children, because we believe in Jesus. It's not by what we do. It's not by our performance, by, by, but by what we believe. So we're going to start being persuaded by this truth because then we can be at rest when we understand this in our relationship with the Father and how we pray. And that's how we stop being, uh, stop relating to him as a son and uh, servant, sorry, and start relating to him as a son. Okay, I love the beginning of Galatians 5.1. Paul says, stand firm then and don't be yoked again to bondage or slavery. Don't put yourself back under the law system of where you feel you've got to do something to earn from God, whether it's salvation or anything else. And I love this graphic I found. We've just got to, by renewing our mind, and I hope this picture can um, point this out and make it clear, you know, that I want you to understand that everything that we do within our Christian life, you know, whether it's prayer and communion, praise and worship, thanksgiving, flowing in the gifts, church attendance, grace giving, uh, serving in any capacity, whether you're a pastor or a leader or whether, you know, whatever you do for the Lord, um, Bible study, quiet time, fellowship with God and even with other believers, that all this stuff that we do uh, and even meditating on how good he is, it, it, it's not. these are not all separate, but it's what should be flowing from our relationship with him. It's an extension. It's fruit that flows. It's not a work of the flesh that we have to produce. God's not after that, but a fruit that flows from love. We give, freely we receive, we freely give, not because we have to, not because the scripture tells us to, but we have a revelation that because we've freely been given, we can freely give. We give not under compulsion, as Paul says, you give out of not what what you don't have, you give out of what you have, what you've decided in your heart to give. You're led by the spirit, then you're not under the law. And that's with everything else that we do. We're led by the spirit. Okay, so if you feel that you've got to do any of those things out of an obligation, a sense of obligation or duty, then you're not functioning in freedom of your relationship. You, you're bound to a system. You're still under slavery because you're compelled. Uh, you're under compulsion. You know, that's what you feel. That's what I need to do as a believer. What for? You don't gain approval from God. When you understand the finished work of Jesus, you've already got everything. So why do you do the things you do? So then let that be confronting for you so you can stop and then just start resting in God's love and then letting his love flow in you and through you and letting him guide you and lead you in whatever you do in your Christian life and beyond. But unfortunately, all that stuff I just shared, we've been told this is what a believer must do. And, uh, you know, so they've all become separate entities and like a checklist, right? I've done this, I've done this, I've done that, I've, you know. But remember, the only thing that pleases him is faith in his son. We're so caught up with wanting to work and do stuff for God. But look at John 6, 28 to 29, the Amplified Classic. I love it. So Jesus, these people approached Jesus and said, what are we to do? Because they realized he was their Messiah. Okay, then Jesus, you're the Messiah. So what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? And Jesus replied, this is the work or service that God asks of you. <laughs> that you believe in the one whom he has sent, that you believe to trust on and have faith in his messenger. Believe, have faith in me. We're so busy. What must I do to serve you, God? How am I going to please you today? You know, I need to serve. I need to give. I need to pray. I need to do this. That's a servant mentality. What God asks of you, the works, the service that he wants of you is to believe in Jesus, to rest in Jesus and his finished work. It's beautiful, isn't it? Let this truth make you free. 
Anything you do that you feel you need to do, it, to do as a requirement um, or to be accepted by God or even to function as a believer, it negates faith, which rests in Jesus' performance alone. That is powerful. I'm going to say that again. Anything you feel you need to do as a requirement to be accepted by God or to function as a believer negates true faith. And true faith rests on Jesus' performance alone. That's when you can rest in your relationship with God Okay, our life needs to be an expression of our faith in Jesus. That's not a work. That's not an obligation. That's not a duty. Always remember that God was motiva- motivated by unconditional love for us. That while we were s- still sinners, while we were without strength, Jesus died for us. 1 John 3 1 it says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Meditate on that. Because of God's great love for us, God provided everything freely for us. He does not want us to feel eternally obligated to pay Him back. He doesn't need, demand, or require us to work for Him to do favors for him, you know, <laughs> to even receive salvation or gifts or healing, anything else, okay? Um, to serve him through ministry or through religious duty by giving and doing and thanking and praising and, you know, to worship him. He doesn't demand worship through prayer, praise, thanksgiving, to show our gratitude. If you feel you need to do this, that God requires it of you, that it's a function of a believer, it, the motivation is coming from an obligation or a duty. Is Whereas when you know what God has done for you through your son, I can't help. I begin my prayers, you know, when I pray, when I open in prayer, every time it's the same, it may sound like rote, but it's, you know, it's so simple. Thank you, God, for what you did for us through your son. Thank you. I'm et- I am eternally grateful. It's out of our heart of thank God for Jesus. You know, when you unlearn all this stuff, you know, God doesn't demand you. Look, I hope you get this. God provided everything freely for you. He doesn't want you to feel eternally obligated to pay him back through your service. He doesn't want you to feel like I've got to do something for God now. And, And within a big church, there's stuff we have to do to function within that church. You do need people to serve and give, etc. And sometimes that relates this way because that's where what we're taught. But God doesn't need you to work for him or to serve him. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I came to lay my life down for you so that you can have eternal life, that you can have my life, that I provide that life for you. How do you experience it? By believing in me. So what? Whatever you do for for God through life and ministry, unless you're led by the Spirit where He equips and empowers you, it's really you're going to be laboring and striving in your own ability anyway. There's no ease on it. You'll It'll be hard. But when you know there's a calling there and when you know that calling's there, then when you get past all this stuff, you know that you have been equipped and empowered and as you learn to trust him it will flow your life will flow the gifts will flow everything will flow so we've got to get past any religious mindset anything where we feel i must or i need to whether it's pray give serve whatever okay because it is a reaction that's a reaction it's under compulsion to a law and works mindset which is a servant rather than just responding to God's love and having faith in Jesus and knowing that that's where we get loved, accepted and approved through faith in Jesus alone. So guilt, remind yourself that guilt is the language of a servant because when you stop to do all the stuff you do, and this is the process I went through and I know others have as well, especially in your prayer life, when you realize, hang on, I don't need to pray for all this stuff because Jesus has already provided. So all this prayer list stuff that I had, hang on, you did that, you did this, you did that. I've got the answer to that already. I know I can get the answer for that already. I need wisdom for that so I can do that through relationship. And I went through my prayer list and I'm thinking, here I am laboring and striving on hours on end covering all these things every night when you've already provided this for me. So my prayer life went from hours to reduced quite considerably. Instead, now, most of the time, I just spend time being still uh, in his presence where there's worship music. There's a whole different ways um, 
that I can connect with him. But ultimately, I've learned to communicate with him throughout my whole day, that, that, my, that you can be constantly praying without ceasing where you're hearing and responding and aware that he's there with you always. I'm not saying not to set aside time. Absolutely not. Some people actually function better that way, and I do do that as well. But it's not this big, long uh, hours like it used to be, okay? Um, how you do it, how you relate, that's between you and the Father. But no, if you don't do it one day, that you're not going to lose any favor or anything from God, which I kind of felt that's where I came from. And so as I began to grow in the finished work and in my relationship, learning how to pray as a son or exist as a son in relationship, I felt guilty that I wasn't praying enough. I felt guilty that I wasn't serving enough. I still did ministry and everything like that, but not with the same force that I was doing it before. I, it went from being out of an obligation and a duty to flowing from a relationship. And it, there wasn't that drive there anymore. There was that rest. But I kind of felt guilty that I wasn't praying the amount of times I was, you know, the hours that I was praying as before. And you know what? It, you know, it, that was in every area. You know, and if I missed church for one reason because we had something on, you know, something happened, I didn't feel guilty about it anymore. You know, now as pastors, we never get to uh, not have church. <laughs> we don't have a choice. But, you know, as if you were like me you may feel that oh i miss church today you do feel guilty that's not sonship you know we've got to get past that mentality and, and you do you will face this you will feel guilty you'll feel like this void and you begin to question what's right what's wrong but go back to basics go back to your relationship build from there keep it simple really and remind yourself that guilt and shame and condemnation is the language of the law Remember Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul said that if you fear, you're not made perfect in God's love because fear has got to do with punishment and torment. Don't feel under any obligation uh, within your life, within your ministry, with how you relate to God. Okay? I love what John says here in uh, chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. He says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. So if you condemn yourself because I'm not praying enough, I'm not giving enough, I'm not serving enough, I'm not doing enough, he's saying that God's greater than your heart, you know? So don't condemn yourself. And no, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. But if our heart does condemn us, we don't have confidence, but that's that we still have the same relationship, nothing's changed. But in our heart, we relate to him differently, really. So really, don't let your heart condemn you. God is greater than your heart. He knows all things. He knows what he's already done for you through his son. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So verse 23, he qualifies, love this, look at this. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Again, just what Jesus was asked. What are we to do to do the works of God? Believe in me. So simple, isn't it? So we've got to get back to that place of sonship. Okay, we're on the home run. I just want to read out this scripture to you. So guilt, shame, condemnation is a language of a servant, not doing enough, not being right in any way, shape or form. Lack in any way, shape or form comes from being having a servant mentality. Rest is the language of a son. And when you're coming from sonship, I love Romans 5, 1 to 4, the classic Amplified says, Therefore, since we are justified, which means acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God. And through the, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, through him also we have our access, entrance, introduction by faith into this grace, which is state of God's favor, in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God, when the glory of God is Christ in you. Okay, and moreover, let us also be full of joy now. 
And I'll continue in a second. But look at this. Let us grasp the fact that we have peace of reconciliation to hold and enjoy peace with God through Jesus and what he's done for us. Let us rejoice of our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God, which is Jesus in us. We can enjoy and rejoice and experience the glory of God. Moreover, let us be full of joy now. And then he says, let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and unserving endurance. And endurance fortitude develops maturity of character, approved faith and tried integrity. And character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Now, verses 3 to 4, where it talks about rejoicing your sufferings, etc. This is like a sister verse to what Paul says later on in Romans 8. Um, remember, so remember we suffer because we live in a fallen world with fallen men, there's an adversary and we suffer persecution. It, it, so we've got to put that in its context. That's the pressure and affliction and the hardship that a lot of the Christians were facing at that time persecution for being believers but it's a sister verse remember what we covered under um what praying um in the spirit is and we saw that um the groanings that we have and that's what this is about here and he, he actually fleshes it out in two more chapters three more chapters so romans 5 romans 6 he says you know you we were dead in adam we basically we're now alive in christ so count yourself dead to sin alive to god romans 7 he talks about how the law produces in you what you don't want to do because it's the law at work in you but verses 8 there's now no condemnation etc etc and then what did we cover we said that the whole you know the whole of creation is groaning travailing as if in, in childbirth because he's it's waiting to be restored uh, for Jesus to return to be restored and to us to be revealed as true sons and then it says then uh, we also uh, groan within ourselves because we want this glorified body we, want, we don't want to live in a fallen world and struggle and suffer in this stuff with persecution or anything else. So we groan within ourselves because we're waiting for that glorified body and for Jesus to return. And this is likewise, the spirit also bears us up in our weakness. And we don't know how to pray according to this as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes you know, and what's that intercession by revealing Jesus and his finished work to us is the context and what we went through there. So it's a sister verse with that. Um, so I just wanted to, to cover that bit there, but I love that. Moreover, verse three, let us be full of joy now. Let us rest that we have peace with God, reconciliation. We can enjoy the glory of God, you know, because of what Jesus has freely provided for us. There is something to rejoice, to be thankful and to shout from the, the rooftops, the treetops, you know, and, and that's what Sean and I try and do, to preach on Jesus' finished work to whoever will listen, you know, because we want people free and free indeed. Okay, so always remember unconditional love, that love, peace and strength, acceptance, everything from God uh, it comes from resting in God's unconditional love for you. Let that be your starting point. Jesus finished work, that Jesus uh, is more than enough for you. Let that be your starting point and learn to flow from there because everything that comes from the kingdom has to flow through the indwelling spirit as a fruit and not a work of your flesh, okay? All the gifts, the ministry gifts, everything we do should flow as a fruit, not tr tried to be produced by the work of your flesh, okay? It's so simple, isn't it? But we got to, it's a lifetime to really learn how to do that and see what that looks like for us. So whatever you do for God, let it be through the leading of his Holy Spirit as a son, through his unconditional love for you, because there will be an ease and a flow, and ultimately focus on relationship. Let him show you how to connect with him. Let him show you where you've got mindsets of, of servant, being a servant or an old covenant focused. Let him show you, you know, by showing his love to you. So then you can go, you know what? Okay, why do I do that? Why do I approach that? What's that thinking behind that? Okay, I'm going to break the chains of that one 
in my thinking by casting that down and bringing that captive to Jesus, knowing that Jesus, my faith in you is enough. I am a child of God. I don't have to earn favor with God, acceptance with God. I'm already there. The kingdom already belongs to me because I'm already seated with him in heavenly places. I've already been equipped and empowered with everything I need for life and godliness through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so, as Paul says in Romans 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so let the indwelling Holy Spirit continue to bear witness with your spirit that you are his child. You're not a slave. You're not a servant. That Jesus is enough for you. Amen. Thank you.